Sherlock Holmes. The Hound of the Baskervilles. Chapter 14. The night was clear and fine above us. The stars shone cold and bright, while a half-moon bathed the whole scene in a soft, uncertain light. Before us lay the dark bulk of the house, its serrated roof and bristling chimneys hard outlined against the silver-spangled sky. Broad bars of golden light from the lower windows stretched across the orchard and the moor. One of them was suddenly shut off. The servants had left the kitchen. There only remained the lamp in the dining room where the two men, the murderous host and the unconscious guest, still chatted over their cigars. Every minute that white woolly plain which covered one half of the moor was drifting closer and closer to the house. Already the first thin wisps of it were curling across the golden square of the lighted window. The farther wall of the orchard was already invisible, and the trees were standing out of a swirl of white vapor. As we watched it, the fog wreaths came crawling around both corners of the house and rolled slowly into one dense bank on which the upper floor and the roof floated like a strange ship upon a shadowy sea. Holmes struck his hand passionately upon the rock in front of us and stamped his feet in his impatience. If he isn't out in a quarter of an hour, the path will be covered. In half an hour, we won't be able to see our hands in front of us. Shall we move farther up upon higher to move farther back upon higher ground? Yes, I think it would be as well. So as the fog bank flowed onward, we fell back before it until we were half a mile from the house, and still that dense white sea, with the moon silvering its upper edge, swept slowly and inexorably on. We are going too far, said Holmes. We dare not take the chance of his being overtaken before he can reach us. At all costs we must hold our ground where we are. He dropped on his knees and clapped his ear to the ground. Thank God, I think that I hear him coming. A sound of quick steps broke the silence of the moor. Crouching among the stones, we stared intently at the silver-tipped bank in front of us. The steps grew louder, and through the fog, as though a curtain, there stepped a man whom we were awaiting. He looked around him in surprise as he emerged into the clear, starlit night. Then he came swiftly along the path, passed close to where we lay, and went up on up the long slope behind us. As he walked, he glanced continually over either shoulder, like a man who was ill at ease. Hist! cried Holmes, and I heard the sharp click of a cocking pistol. Look out, it's coming! <clears throat> there was a thin, crisp, continuous patter from somewhere in the heart of the crawling bank. <clears throat> the cloud was within fifty yards of where we lay, and we glared at it, all three, uncertain what horror was about to break from the heart of it. I was at Holmes' elbow, and I glanced for an instant at his face. It was pale and exultant, his eyes shining brightly in the moonlight. But suddenly they started forward in a rigid, fixed stare, and his lips parted in amazement. At the same instant, Lestrade gave a yell of terror and threw himself face downward upon the ground. I sprang to my feet, my inert hand grasping my pistol, my mind paralyzed by the dreadful shape which had sprung out among, upon us from the shadows of the fog. A hound it was, an enormous coal-black hound, but not such a hound as, mor as mortal eyes have ever seen. Fire burst from its open mouth, its eyes glowed with a smoldering glare, its muzzle and hackles and dewlap were outlined in flickering flame. Never in the delirious dream of a disordered brain could anything more savage, more appalling, more hellish be conceived in that dark form and savage face which broke out upon us out of the wall of fog. With long bounds, a huge black creature was leaping down the track, following hard upon the footsteps of our friend. So paralyzed were we by the apparition that we allowed him to pass before we had recovered our nerve. Then Holmes and I both fired together, and the creature gave a hideous howl, which showed that one at least had hit him. He did not pause, however, but bounded onward. Far away on the path, we saw Sir Henry looking back, his face white in the moonlight, his hands raised in horror, glaring helplessly at the frightful thing which was hunting him down. But that cry of pain from the hound had blown all our fears to the winds. If he was vulnerable, he was mortal, and if he was, we could wound him, we could kill him. Never have I seen a man run as Holmes ran that night. I am reckoned fleet of foot, but he outpaced me much as I outpaced a little professional. In front of us, as we flew up the track, we heard scream after scream from Sir Henry and a deep roar of the hound. I was in time to see the beast spring upon its victim, hurl him to the ground, and worry at his throat. Well, the next instant, Holmes had emptied five barrels of, of his revolver into the creature's flank. 
With a last howl of agony and a vicious snap in the air, it rolled upon its back, four feet pawing furiously, and then fell limp upon its side. I stooped, panting, and pressed my pistol to the dreadful shimmering head, but it was useless to press a trigger. The giant hound was dead. <clears throat> Sir Henry lay insensible where he had fallen. We tore away his collar, and Holmes breathed a prayer of gratitude when we saw that there was no sign of a wound and that the rescue had been in time. Already her friend's eyelids shivered and he made a feeble attempt to move. Lestrade thrust his brandy flask between the baronet's teeth, and the two frightened eyes were looking upon us. My God, he whispered, what was it? What in heaven na heaven's name was it? It's dead, whatever it is, said Holmes. We've laid the family ghost once and forever.